In the last lecture, we introduced matrices and covered some common terms. This time, we'll look at some very important properties of matrices. These properties might seem abstract at first, but we'll use them over and over again in the rest of the course. Pretty much all the linear algebra-based algorithms you'll come across will make use of the properties we're going to cover here. First, let's talk about the transpose of a matrix. We've already talked about the transpose of a vector, and for matrices, it's similar. We just swap the rows of the matrix with its columns. I've written it out here for an arbitrary matrix A. Take a good look at how the elements move between A and A transpose. The columns of A are the rows of A transpose, and likewise, the rows of A are the columns of A transpose. So, if A is a matrix in R M by N, then A transpose is a matrix in R N by M. You can also think of a transpose as rotating a matrix 180 degrees around the diagonal line that connects A11, A22, A33, and on and on. Next, we have the range and rank. The range of a matrix is just the span of its columns. We can write it abstractly like this. We multiply our matrix A by the vector x, where x is some vector with n elements. We repeat this for every possible combination of values for x. Then, the set of all the output vectors is the range of A. This means that if A has m rows, the output vectors all have m elements. So the range of A is a subset of Rm. The name range makes sense because the range is the set of vectors that can be hit by the matrix A. If some vector in Rm, let's call it vector y, is not in the range of A, then no vector x exists where y equals ax. The rank, on the other hand, is just the dimension of the range. We can write dimension as just dim. So rank A equals dim range A. Note that the range of A is a subset of Rm, and specifically, it's a subspace. This subspace could be m-dimensional, or less. If m is 3, then the rank could be 3, 2, 1, or even 0. Rank 1 means all the output vectors lie on a line, which means they're all scalar multiples of the same vector. And rank 0 means a times x equals 0 for any x. So the range of a is just the 0 vector, which is really just a point. Now let's talk about something called onto. If we have some arbitrary matrix A in R M by N, and the range of A is R M, meaning the range covers exactly the entirety of R M, then we say that A is onto. And I know this sounds weird because in English onto is a preposition, but in math we use it as an adjective. Now, what this definition means is that if A is onto, then any vector in R M can be hit by A. Given any vector y in Rm, we can always find some x in Rn where y equals ax. So this means that if A is onto, the following statements are true and equivalent. First, the range of A contains all possible m vectors. Second, the columns of A span Rm. And finally, the rows of A are independent. This last one isn't immediately obvious. We'll go over a quick, simple proof in a minute. Let's look at rank in a little more detail. Here are some facts. The rank of A is the number of independent columns. The rank is the dimension of the range, and the dimension of the range is just the number of independent vectors. Any dependent column vectors of A won't add more dimensions to the range. Next, sometimes you'll hear the terms column rank and row rank. Column rank is just the rank we've been talking about so far. It's the number of independent columns. Row rank, as you can guess, is the number of independent rows. If you remember the definition of transpose, you can put two and two together and realize that the row rank of A is just the column rank of A transpose. However, the second bullet point I have here says that the column rank and row rank of A are always equal. This isn't obvious, and to prove it, we need to use a tool called QR factorization, which we'll cover in a later lecture. For now though, you can just think of this as an important fact. This fact implies the third and final fact here, which says that the rank of A must be less than or equal to the minimum of M and N. For example, if M is less than N, then the rank must be less than M, and vice versa. Also, in particular, if the rank of A is exactly the minimum of M and N, then we say the matrix is full rank. 
This just means the matrix has the maximum possible rank it could have. So for example, if we have a skinny matrix, we know n is less than m, so a full rank skinny matrix must have rank n. If we have a fat matrix, we know m is less than n, so a full rank fat matrix must have rank m. Lastly, of course a full rank n by n square matrix has rank n. Full rank is an important property because it basically says the output space of a full rank matrix is as big as it could possibly be. Now it's time to prove that statement we learned about a couple slides ago. I want to keep this course light on proofs, but in this case, I think it's worth going over because it chains together all the concepts we've just talked about. So let's prove that if A is onto, then the rows of A must be independent. Let's start with our usual arbitrary matrix A with M rows and N columns. And let's start with the definition of onto, which says that the range of A is Rm. Now, by definition, range of A equals Rm means that the rank of A equals M. Let's remember that row rank and column rank are always equal. So the row rank of A is also M. But the rank is the number of independent vectors. Since A has M rows, and the row rank of A is M, we know that the only possibility is that all the rows of A are independent. Okay, that's the end of the proof. If that logic seems circular, take a good look, because it's not. The key fact we used is that column rank equals row rank. See if you can understand and visualize every step. That will really let you know if you've got a solid grasp on these definitions. Finally, the statement we just proved here implies something interesting. If the matrix A is onto, then A can't be a skinny matrix. If you visualize this, it's obvious. If A is skinny, then it has fewer columns than rows. For example, imagine a 3 by 2 matrix. You have two column vectors, each of which is a 3D vector. For the matrix A to be onto, the column vectors have to cover 3D space. But there's no way you can cover 3D space with just two vectors. You need at least three. If A is skinny, then by definition, you have fewer columns than you need for A to be onto. Let's move on to a different but closely related topic, the null space. The null space of a matrix is the set of input vectors where A times the vector is zero. You can think of it as the matrix A taking all the vectors in the null space and sending them to the zero vector in the output space. Equivalently, you can think of the null space as the set of vectors orthogonal to all rows of the matrix, since matrix multiplication is the dot product of the matrix rows with the input vector. To get a grasp on this abstract definition, here's some visual intuition. Our matrix A has n column vectors, each vector being m-dimensional. Imagine drawing the span of the columns of A. You'll end up drawing a subspace of m-dimensional space. Now look at the origin of this subspace. It's going to be the zero vector of m-dimensional space. The null space is just the set of all coefficients that make the n column vectors of A sum to zero. Well, it's possible that the only combination of coefficients that makes the column vectors add to zero is the zero vector of n dimensions. The zero input vector is the only element of the null space. This should ring a bell. This means that the columns of A are independent. When this is the case, that is, when zero is the only element of the null space, then we say that A is one-to-one. -one. This term means there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input vectors and output vectors. There's no ambiguity. Each unique input vector gets mapped to a unique output vector. If you know one, you can uniquely recover the other. On the other hand, if zero is not the only element of the null space, then there's a really important practical implication here. Imagine we have a matrix A with two vectors x and y. Let's say ax equals zero, but ay is not equal to zero. In this scenario, what would happen if we multiplied A by the vector x plus y. Well, since matrix multiplication is linear, we have a times the sum of x plus y equals ax plus ay, which equals ay. This means we can translate y by x, or any scalar times x, and our output vector will be exactly the same. So the key point here is that the matrix A cannot detect any translation in the x direction. The x direction is a source of ambiguity. You'll see in a later lecture how this ambiguity, due to a non-zero null space, 
can have serious consequences for practical applications. We'll need to build up some more concepts before we try to tackle that though. By the way, sometimes the null space of a matrix is called the kernel of a matrix. You'll see it written as per of A. And sometimes you'll see null of A written as just a fancy N of A. Okay, now let's close the loop and come to a concept called nullity. The nullity of a matrix is just the dimension of the null space. Nullity A equals dim null A. As for the last point, I'm not trying to give you PTSD flashbacks about the SAT, but I think this analogy is an easy way to keep your terms straight. Rank is to range as nullity is to null space. We covered two related concepts so far, null space and range. These are complementary concepts, but not quite completely opposite. One thing to remember is that null space is about the input vectors for a matrix, but range is about the output vectors. Let's take a minute to visualize things. I have a three-dimensional coordinate system here. So this is R3. Embedded inside my three-dimensional space is a two-dimensional subspace, the blue diagonal plane here. Now imagine this subspace is the range of a matrix A with three rows and two columns. We've got two column vectors where each vector is three-dimensional. Since the range is a 2D subspace, in other words, the rank is two, and since we have two column vectors, we know that A is full rank. That implies the null space only contains the zero vector. The only combination of x1 and x2 that makes the column vectors cancel each other out is when x1 and x2 are both zero. Now let's forget about the previous matrix. Imagine instead that this blue 2D subspace is the range of a matrix A with three rows and three columns. The situation is really different here. We have three column vectors, where each vector is three dimensional, but the range of A, in other words, the span of the three column vectors, is only a 2D subspace. This means the rank of A is two. This means the column vectors are linearly dependent, and specifically, one column vector is redundant. No matter what values of x1, x2, and x3 we choose, we can never produce an output vector that lies outside of the 2D blue plane. The matrix A has a null space that includes non-zero vectors. If you think about it, the null space of A is actually a one-dimensional subspace. Although there are infinitely many vectors in the null space, these vectors are all scalar multiples of each other, so any basis of the null space would consist of exactly one vector. The null space is a line. This intuitively makes sense because the range is 2D, but the output vectors are 3D vectors. So the one last dimension is in the null space. It turns out this intuitive idea about how the rank and nullity are related is actually a more precise general principle. This principle is a conservation of dimension. I don't know about you, but I think this sounds pretty cool. But what does this mean exactly? There's this neat thing called the rank nullity theorem for any matrix. The rank of that matrix plus its nullity will always equal n, the number of columns. This means each dimension in the input space either goes to the output or gets crushed into the zero vector. Each input dimension either shows up in the range or it ends up in the null space. If the matrix A represents some sort of sensor, then we can ascribe a physical meaning to this. Each input dimension that goes into the sensor will either show up in the sensor's measurements or the sensor will ignore that dimension. The proof of the rank nullity theorem also requires QR factorization, so we'll come back to this later. All right, I just want to pause for a moment to appreciate how nicely everything came together. We looked at range, rank, null space, and nullity, and all those concepts are tied together in this clean, simple formula that holds true for any matrix. I hope you can appreciate the beauty of that. We're going to switch gears and finish this lecture with a different but equally important topic, orthogonality. So you know that two vectors are orthogonal if their dot product is zero. But if you have a set of vectors, two or more, and the dot product between any two of those vectors is zero, then we say the set of vectors is orthogonal. For short, people will often just say orthogonal vectors instead of sets of orthogonal vectors every time. However, be sure to remember that one vector by itself cannot be an orthogonal vector. Orthogonality is a property of a set of vectors. Another quick piece of terminology is normalized vector. A normalized vector is just a vector whose norm is one. Note that you can take any vector and multiply it by one over its length, and you'll end up with a new vector that is normalized and points in the same direction 
as the original, unnormalized vector. Now we can combine the last two concepts to get a third one. A set of orthogonal, normalized vectors is said to be orthonormal. There are two important properties that follow from this definition. An orthonormal set of vectors is independent. Actually, this is also true for an orthogonal set of vectors. Since the dot product between any two vectors is zero, we can't express any of the vectors as the sum of the other vectors. Each vector lies along a unique dimension. The next property is that if you have a set of k orthonormal vectors, and arrange them as the columns of a matrix, which we'll call u, then u transpose times u will equal the k by k identity matrix. To see why this is true, note that since the columns of u are orthonormal vectors, that means the rows of u transpose are those same orthonormal vectors with the same ordering. When you multiply u transpose with u, you're taking dot products between orthonormal vectors. If you take the dot product of two different orthonormal vectors, you get zero. And if you take the dot product of an orthonormal vector with itself, you get one because the vectors all have length one. So you end up with ones along the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else, which is exactly what the identity matrix is. Okay, now here's the last new concept. An orthogonal matrix is a square matrix U that satisfies U transpose times U equals the identity matrix. Note that this is different from the last slide because here we've specified that U must be square. One word of caution. The term orthogonal matrix can be confusing. An orthogonal matrix has orthonormal columns, not orthogonal columns. Let me say it again. An orthogonal matrix has orthonormal columns. Don't make the mistake of calling them orthonormal matrices. As far as I know, that's not a correct term. I hear people mistakenly say orthonormal matrix all the time, but now you know the proper term is orthogonal matrix. Also, as far as I know, there's no term for a matrix whose columns are simply orthogonal, not orthonormal. That's okay because orthonormal column vectors are much more useful and prevalent and will rarely come across orthogonal columns. Here's one important note. Let's say u is a square matrix and r n by n. Since the n column vectors of u are independent, and since each column vector is a vector in n dimensions, we know that the column vectors span r n. This means the columns of an orthogonal matrix u in r n by n form a basis for r n. Remember our definition of basis from an earlier lecture. Finally, note that orthogonal matrices preserve the lengths of their input vectors and they also preserve the angles between vectors. We say that orthogonal matrices are isometric, which means they preserve distances. So what does this mean visually? Orthogonal matrices show up everywhere, but especially in physics. In particular, rotation matrices are a special type of orthogonal matrix. You can have rotation matrices in any number of dimensions, but to keep it simple, let's look at two dimensions. Imagine you have some angle theta, not a variable, but a specific value for the angle then you can create this two by two matrix here. If you multiply this matrix by a vector, the output vector will have the same length as the input vector, but it'll be rotated by theta. In this graph, E1 and E2 are basis vectors, and these are our input vectors. We multiply each vector by the rotation matrix to rotate these vectors by theta. E1 goes to E1 prime, and E2 goes to E2 prime. Note that the angle between E1 and E2 is 90 degrees, and the angle between E1 prime and E2 prime is also 90 degrees. The angle between vectors is preserved, and so are the lengths, so distance is preserved. It's a rotation after all. Reflection matrices are another special type of orthogonal matrix. Here's the formula for generating a 2D reflection matrix. Half of the angle theta defines the line of reflection. Note that E1 gets reflected across the line up to E1 prime, while E2 gets reflected across the line down to E2 prime. In this case, lengths and angles between vectors are also preserved. E1 prime and E2 prime still have 90 degrees between them. That's everything for this lecture. You've learned a lot about range, null space, and orthogonal matrices. Thanks for making it this far. I know these definitions and concepts might seem abstract, but over time I hope to show you just how concrete they are. Next time we'll play around with matrices in Python, and we'll look at robotics as an application.